let me introduce myself. My name is Dr. Dwight Radcliffe. I am the academic dean uh, of the William E. Pinnell Center for Black Church Studies, assistant professor of mission theology and culture. And I am just elated and overjoyed to be able to work with such great people um, here at Fuller and throughout our communities and students and staff to be able to bring together uh, this event. Today is the first day of our uh, week-long three-day celebration of the life, the work, the legacy of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And so this morning at 10 a.m., we had the privilege to be able to hear from uh, I, I know it's it's church it's church language, but from one of God's best, <laughs> one of God's best. Come on, it's church language. It's church language. Uh, Reverend Doctor Pastor H. B. Charles of Shiloh Baptist Church, uh, and we are so glad to have him again uh, for this conversation. I think it's a necessary conversation, and I think it's I think it's a conversation that um, is not just necessary because of the time that we're in, but I think it's also necessary. Um, and when I say the time that we are in, I mean in this modern, uh, uh, modern revision of the of, of of the civil rights movement, this this modern protest movement. But I think also in the midst of everything that's going on with this enduring and lasting and historic uh, pandemic, and even just the state of the church and the state of preaching, I think this is a really good conversation to have right now. I will be honest and say that. Um, when the pandemic first forced most uh, churches, um, forced us to a virtual uh, platform, um, we got to hear a whole lot of preaching that we did not necessarily get to hear when we were all in inside of our four walls. And so I'd love to, um, to engage the conversation. But let me first, uh, once again, welcome our guest, Reverend Dr. Pastor, uh, almost a bishop, almost a bishop, I'm sorry, uh, the, the, the Reverend. <laughs> The Reverend Dr. H.B. Cross. I'm so glad to have you. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. H.B. is fine with me. That's good. <laughs> but it's a joy to be with you. Let's talk, um, and, and I believe they may have sent you just a couple of basic questions we want to run through uh, today. But I want to start even first um, a, a, a practice that my, my friend uh, Janelle uh, Austin out of Minneapolis uh, started me on, allowing mm -hmm. people to self-introduce, um, allowing yeah. people to talk about what they think is is pertinent or relevant about themselves. So just take a, a minute and introduce us to HB. And I want to say, having read your, your church bio and having read your other bio, I've got a couple of terrorists, I mean, children at home. <laughs> <laughs> like a of Absolutely. <laughs> I'm HB Charles Jr. The first thing uh, I'm always asked is what that stands for. And it stands for nothing. It's not my name. I, my daddy did it to me and I did it to my son. Uh, I am happily married to uh crystal who i met in high school and um we've been blessed to have three children uh two are in college and uh, the 13 year old is home uh terrorizing us uh i am a third generation baptist pastor mm -hmm. um i grew up in a preacher's home i professed faith in christ as a as a boy and was baptized as a follower of Jesus Christ, and um, as a boy as well, the Lord placed a call to preach on my life. Um, I don't say any of this recommending it. It's just my biography. Yeah, I was called to preach as a boy, and um, really, uh, I pressured my father and the men of the church because I, I was eager to preach. Mm. Um, they let me take a shot at it the first time at 11 years old. Mm. And um, whatever they thought, um, at 11 years old, I had no expectation except that I would spend my life preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I did not know what that would look like. Yeah. Um, but I, I knew that this was the, the calling of God on my life. Yes. My dad was a friend of preachers in Los Angeles. So by the time um, I was 13, I was having opportunities to preach yeah. all over Los Angeles at yeah. youth days, usher days, you name it, <laughs> BTU. Um, my father passed when I was 16. Mm -hmm. And um, a year later, I was called to succeed him at uh, the church he had served for 40 years. I was 17 years old. Again, I don't recommend that. It's just my testimony. 
And I served that church for 18 years. And um, in 2008, the Lord uh, called me to the congregation that I serve now in Jacksonville, Florida, and I'm in my 14th year of ministry here. And throughout that period um, of my t- of ministry, preaching um, has been my conviction that preaching is the primary task of my pastoral work. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. So, so let me just follow up that. Why is, for, for, for you, why is preaching so important? <clears throat> Well, I believe that Paul's charge to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, is the Lord's charge to the church mm-hmm. to preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say personally, Paul's language is the is the burden of my heart. Necessity has been laid upon me and woe unto me yeah. if I preach not the gospel. I am um, I have a fire shut up in my bones to preach. Yes, sir. Um but I do also believe in terms of pastoral work, basically the Lord gives us two tools to work with. If you ask me to summarize my understanding of what my primary role as a pastor is, I would steal the language of the apostles in Acts 6, 4, that uh, we devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Yes. And those are the foundations of ministry. Those are the tools of ministry. I believe those are the primary task of ministry. If you ask me uh, what's more important, prayer, ministry of the word, if you are on a plane 30,000 feet in the, in the air, what's more important, the left wing or the right wing? <laughs> Both of them <laughs> are essential. <laughs> and they are the fuel. I don't, I don't think that they are just um, to season the work. I think the, the, the hard spiritual work of pastoral ministry is rooted in prayer and the ministry of the word. And I believe that um, if I may, 2 Timothy 2.15 is also a life verse. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who has no need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In the final inspection, the Lord is not going to ask us the size of anything. He's not going to ask us about buildings and programs and books and conferences or any of the things that we are tempted to make such a big deal about in ministry. I think the primary thing that we are going to have to give an account for is our stewardship of how we handle the sacred scriptures. Yeah. Amen. 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 All right, let's get into it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So how would you describe, um, I'm, I'm, I've heard your passion for the call of preaching. Um, I heard, I hear how you were burst into it. I hear how it's pressed upon you hearing some of the key scriptures that are important for you as you understand preaching. Let's talk about the the role of preaching, the function um, of preaching in the church. How do you see, what is that role? What is that function? Um, I'm a, I'm a basketball guy. So I, you know, I like basketball analogies. Uh, I know we're in Mm -hmm. a positionless basketball, um, but I still believe that the point guard has a role. I still believe that the power forward, the center has a role. Um, the yeah. coach has a role. So what do you what do you what do you see as maybe the role or the function of preaching in the church? If I may say it this way, um just a, just up front, I'm 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 nurtured in the Baptist tradition. And in in the tradition of the church I grew up in, unlike other denominational traditions, the pulpit is in the center of the sanctuary. With all due respect, the first time I went to a church and saw it off to the side, yeah. I, I was blown away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think there is a, there is theological symbolism in that architectural setting that I think the essence of the life of the church, the word for church in the New Testament is an assembly, a gathering. Mm, yeah. And and I think most essential to what it means to be the church is our gathering together publicly and corporately to worship King Jesus. And I believe the centerpiece of the gathering of God's people is the proclamation of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so I, I believe the primary, central, and definitive function of the church is to preach the word. And I believe that 
everything else that the church does should be viewed as an extension mm. of the ministry of the word. And so whatever way you would describe the most important, the most central, definitive role of, of, of the body life of the church, that is where I would insert the place of, of preaching. Um, the, I think biblically, historically, the church rises and falls on, on the preaching of God's word. Now, let me also say, I, I don't know. Um, if that's the reality in, in American churches. Um, there are a lot of other things that compete with the ministry of the word and have usurped the authority of the ministry of the word. And um, I, I, I think, I think that is an un, I think that is unfaithful. Mm -hmm. I think our attitude toward the proclamation of God's word is a demonstration, an expression of where we believe the power lies. <laughs> mm. Mm. Um, and yeah. the power lies, God works in the hearts of people through his word. And uh, primarily then, it's our job to proclaim it. Yeah, yeah. Hearing that um, preaching, having this central, this central role what are some of the things that, it, that, that preaching does in, in the life of the church? What are some of the things that, that preaching produces? What are some of the things that preaching um, should, should ideally, should be able to accomplish or to, to produce? How long you got, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I believe that preaching should be done to evangelistically Mm. to reach the lost. Yeah. I think we should be preaching with the assumption that there are lost people in the assembly. Yeah. And I think we ought to be preaching in such a way that we are modeling for our people how to have gospel conversations. I believe more, yeah. Ephesians, I believe Ephesians 4, the pastor teacher is given to equip the saints to build up the body for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And so I believe it's not only the reaching of the lost. I believe that preaching uh, is at work to equip the saints for ministry. Yes, yes. In that regard, I believe it's for the, the edification of the body of Christ. I also believe that um, preaching is to shape the worship life of the church. B Christian worship should be word based, word centered, word driven. I summarize what we do here in our local church. We sing the word, we read the word, we pray the word, we preach the word, and we see the word in baptism and the Lord's table. Yeah. I, 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 I believe that preaching should shape the worship life of the church. I believe that preaching, uh, earlier we had some conversations about um, the role of the church in society. Yeah. I, I think preaching ought to be a call to action for mm. us to live out our faith outside the body life of, of the church. I believe that preaching, faithful preaching, raises up leaders, the future leaders uh, of the church. I think there should be personal mentoring and specific training, but I believe that the preacher should be preaching every week with the intention of, of raising up the next generation of leaders by how the pulpit handles the word of God. I, I, I believe that preaching is essential to everything the church is supposed to be in. Yeah. And, and, and if I'm, and if I'm bluntly honest, I don't believe that the majority of churches function in that capacity. Um, or or mm -hmm. well, I'd say that there's a large number of churches that don't function in that capacity, that they do believe that mm -hmm. there are other things that there are other things that do that stuff that preaching doesn't necessarily facilitate many of those things. Hmm. Uh -huh. yeah. And I, I would even add, I know you're going to talk about pastoral leadership uh, in the coming days of the conference, but I also think that we lead from the pulpit as pastors. I, I think the direction of the church, I believe the leadership of the church should be shaped. Um, I, I believe 
if I may, that in a real sense, preaching is counseling. It's not one-on-one, it's public, but I, I, I hope that in preaching, I am doing publicly and corporately what I'm doing in counseling privately, basically explaining and applying the word of God. Um, I think this should be rooted in, I think the proper mindset toward preaching is not about preaching itself, not about the act, it's not about the performance. I think it's, a, a, it's rooted in a high view of scripture. Mm. You have a high view of scripture, then what is the vehicle to get the scripture in people's hearts and minds? And preaching and teaching God's word it is the is is the primary way that's to take place. Yeah, yeah. You said preaching is is a call to action. Right? Faithfully, that faithful preaching raises up future future leaders. Um, is that is that solely done in the hearing? Because so much of what you're what what you're saying, and I want to make sure that you get a chance to to fully fully unwrap unwrap. Uh, I don't think that I don't want people to stop with with just the words that you said. So I don't want someone to say. Okay, well, he said that uh, that it, preaching uh, raises up future generations, future future leaders. Not that it stops and ends with preaching. That that, for instance, you don't preach a message and that work gets done. But preaching becomes this this the the, the beginning or the continuation of the faithful feeding of that. Could you unpack that some more? So, if, if if faithful preaching raises up future leaders, it's not solely from the pulpit. We don't lead solely from the we lead from the pulpit, but not only from the pulpit. Yeah, so what I mean by that is 2 Timothy 2, where Paul says to Timothy to be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, and the thing that you have seen and heard from me among many witnesses, yeah, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Yes, sir. Um, I, I think that what you heard from me is his public ministry of the word. It, it was among many witnesses. You, you've been, you, you, you sat under my teaching and somehow he thought that Timothy sitting under his teaching was shaping Timothy's own convictions yes. enough that Timothy was yes, able sir. to pass on the message to a new generation of leaders who would be able to pass it on to those who would teach others also. No, the pulpit doesn't do it all. And when I talk so aggressively about the pulpit, it is not because I think that the pulpit does it all. It's my pushback. Uh, against those who would minimize the primacy of of the proclamation of God's word for the sake of other things. There are many other things the church is to do to raise up leaders, to go forth in Christian service, to properly worship. But, But I think preaching, especially that preaching that is bound to the word of God, becomes the foundation for everything else in the body life of the church. Yeah. And I think I've got an agenda. I think I think we need to hear that correction because I do feel as though there are so many other things that have that have and are competing for that place of primacy. And there are things that are not always scripturally aligned. And then it causes um, it causes a, 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 a shift in the trajectory of where that church, that ministry uh, ends up uh, ends up heading because. We started off. We started off looking slightly different than, than where we should have, and and that that slight difference here means ten years down the road we've got a completely different trajectory all the way. Yeah, I totally agree. So let's go back a little bit. Let's let's go back a little bit and looking at looking at what we'll call the, the civil rights movement then. Um, looking at some of the great leaders, um, great men and women that. Uh, inspired people of diverse faiths, of diverse backgrounds, uh, diverse racial groups um, to to march, to protest, to engage in um, in action, to engage in in a lifestyle that attempted to move our country in a different direction. Um, thinking about the role of preaching even through uh, through that time, what do, you, what do you believe are maybe some of the ways, and I think you've probably already alluded to that, but what do you think are some of the ways that preaching really helped to galvanize people, to motivate people? Uh, what do you think, what, what do you feel is all the role of preaching, how it functioned there? 
So let me go back a little further. I just have a general position. Yeah. And I, from my understanding, biblically and historically, every, it just seems to me that um, if there is a great move of God on a land for reformation and revival, mm. it, it is birthed of prayer and preaching. Um, so I just think that's a biblical and historical precedent. Let's, we can just start there as a foundational yes. principle. Um, and I think that can be fleshed out in the historic civil rights movement of the late 50s, 60s, and early 70s here in America. Um, I feel like this is audacious, but permit me to say, I do not think that Dr. Martin Luther King would have been able to accomplish what he accomplished had he not been the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, the historic American civil rights movement was, was preacher-led and church-based. Talk about and, yeah. and those men who did, who marched, who protested, who organized, the basis from which they did that work, that good and godly work, I believe, was the local church. And the centerpiece of the local church, the platform from which they it was, was the pulpit. And so um, preaching was central to the historic civil rights movement. My father was an, was an older man. And my father was a part of that generation. Yes. And, you know, I, uh, I grew up kind of in a, in a changing of the cultural setting. Um, but I remember as a boy, I grew up with a black mayor mm. in Los Angeles. And I remember the mayor coming to the Baptist Minister's Conference, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and those men gathering on Monday and central to what they did was, was, was preaching. Mm. And um, th these men uh, of that generation um, were men who cared about the community, who worked for justice and righteousness, but yeah. they, they did it rooted with their, I mean, with their lives rooted in the pulpit. Yeah. Um, I, it is an amazing thing I can say about my own father's ministry. My father didn't preach politics in the pulpit. My father was a pastor. He was an evangelist at heart. Okay. And he preached the gospel. But somehow the way he preached, and I mean, he wasn't on, he didn't address a bunch of current events. He wasn't giving commentary on the events of the, of the day. He preached the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And somehow it stirred up the church to action where they were deeply involved in the community. He understood his role to serve his congregation faithfully. And he was deeply involved in so many community matters and affairs. But, but it was all rooted from the work of the pulpit. And I think that's representative not just with Dr. King himself, but all of the college of men that served along with him. Th these were men, if I may, they were men of God who, who, who were committed to, to the pulpit work as well. Yeah. I think one of the, one of the things that, I'm, that, I, that I hear um, that, I'm, I'm reminded, that I'm reminded of as you were speaking is that so often in, in some mainstream evangelical um, circles, there's this separation of life um, that, you know, church life exists here, this life, you know, personal life or work life or what have you. Um, but in this context, and some of it is rooted in, in, in the black cultural, African diaspora, you know, culture, react, cultural realities. Some of it is in a, a, a particular hermeneutic and, and the way that we understand scripture, that we, we understand scripture makes a demand on our lives. And so to preach the word of God, um, you know, and this is what I'm, what, I, what I'm queuing in on, whether you preach an, an overtly, explicitly, quote unquote, political message or not, that 
a challenge in the word of God, standing into in the word of God moves us to do, to act and to be and to live in particular ways. And so it's in, it's impossible for us to, to be under sound preaching. I, if I can be honest, audacious to say, audacious to say that, to be under sound preaching and not have that show up in the way that we care for one another in the way that we embrace and live our lives. And I think that's what I'm hearing a part of what you're saying there. As far as yeah, I would just say, you know, the sign of whether or not it's faithful or not is not that it gets you to show up, but that it gets you to show up as the church. Hmm. And again, I just, I don't think we are to show up as left or right. Hmm. We're to show up as the church. Hmm. And the kingdom has its own agenda. I was watching the uh, one of the football games this weekend and they were going over reviewing a play and and uh one of the commentators said you know sometimes we got to re- remember that every time these games are played there are actually three teams on the on the field <laughs> the the offense the defense and the team of officials mm. and, and the team of officials they ain't re- then they're not supposed to represent either yeah. side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're, yeah. they're to they're to represent a, an authority that's not even there. In, in fact, sometimes they they go and get instructions from people who are at another place who are reviewing it. And I think the church is not to show up with the team colors of the world. We're we're, we're to represent the kingdom of heaven. And um, I think that's important that we, and I do think um, as a young Christian, I don't know how I got my hands on Stanley Horos. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. And uh, oh. William Willimon, I, yeah. Yeah, and, I, uh, yeah. and, and they influenced my early thinking. I read their book as a young man, Resident Aliens. Yes. And that's kind of the language that, um, uh, I picked up and it really influenced my thought. Not that the, not that the church is to retreat from the culture, right. but that the church is to engage the culture as the church. And one of the things that they influenced me to, to think of is that that church is political. Um, I think faithful preaching is subversive activity. You know, <laughs> baptism is, is political. It's the forming of a new community hmm. in Christ Jesus. And it is it is it is that community that preaching should be forming and then dispatching them into the world each week yeah. to be light and salt wherever wherever God has called them to live. Yeah. Now, now you 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 stuck you stuck a pinky toe in this, so I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and put another toe in it. You tell me if we jump out of the pool or not. If we go run the other. <laughs> <way>. <laughs> All right. But somebody mentioned even this morning. And again, I didn't want to address it then. I feel like this is a much better place to, to, to bring it up. Someone mentioned in the comments that, in the chat, that so often the church shows up exactly like you said. The church shows up as a red state, as a blue state. The church shows up as, as pro this and anti this. Um, and the comment was, they really have not seen Christians apart from political agendas. Um, so... How, what are, I'm not asking you to, to, to fully develop an entire theology of this right now, but just as someone who, who obviously cares about the church showing up with a God-given identity and agenda, uh, could you just say a few words about how do we even begin to move in that direction, seeing as we are so extremely uh, divided? And most of the things that we do speak to, they, they tend to land in very political ways. And some of that is society driven but some of that is is our own is our own baggage sure so several things that um i would say there i i mentioned in the earlier conversation that i just finished preaching through first peter and for the past three or four years i've been saying to my congregation that i believe the book of first peter is the book of our times mm. And then, um, you know, a couple of people just challenged me, you know, to preach it. Yeah. You know, um, the the book of First Peter, full fledged imperial 
persecution had not taken place, but there was a growing cultural hostility. Yes, sir. Growing against um, the faith of those who followed the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, Peter is writing to give them hope and to teach them how to be faithful Christians in a hostile society. Come on. And in that regard, one of the burdens I had in preaching is that I'm, I'm not 50 yet, but I'm old enough to have grown up in the generation. Man, I grew up in Los Angeles, California. That, that is not the Bible Belt. But when I was a boy, when my father did funerals and during the funeral procession, people would pull over. Guys on the corner would take off their hats. There, there was enough cultural yes. religion yes, sir. that um, the church felt like it was playing home games, if I can use your sports analogy. Yeah. And I think increasingly what the changing culture, which has changed so rapidly um, and is still doing so, I think, I think we are being confronted with the fact that we need to learn how to play away games. Yeah. This world is not our home. Yeah. And we are playing away games. And really playing away games means you got to be able to call the play, run the play, the coach calls, even though the crowd is trying to drown you out so that you can't do it in an orderly way. And so I think the problem of the church is we think we play in home games and we think we're in our home field and it is not. Yeah. Um, I was, I believe, and this is just my conviction. I believe that to help my church be faithful Christians, I just, I got to do what I can to undermine all, all of the political parties <laughs> because none of them represent the, 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 the United States of America that I thank God for. And we are blessed to live in the land. I, the civil rights movement was able to take advantage of the fact that we live in a land where we are free to participate in the process of our own government. Praise God for that. But the United States of America is not the kingdom of God. And we're to care for the poor. We are to care for uh, racial justice. We're to care for um, those that the streams of life, that is those in the womb, those in the age, those that are aged. There are, there are things that the Bible tells us that are to matter to us. And no political party. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, represents fully what the kingdom agenda is, and so there's a sense in which we've got to we've got to promote kingdom principles, values, and perspectives, and um, and and our allegiance has to be to the Lord Jesus Christ. I really do think that um, the problem with the church today is that we are more concerned about money than Jesus, politics than Jesus and race than Jesus. And it's, it's, it's hard for us to be faithful to God when we put the, those things ahead of what, of what is most important in Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Moving forward, um, I feel like your question might be redundant, but what, what, are, what are some ways that you might see preaching functioning and assisting us today in the midst of some of those same the same issues that 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 your your father's generation um we're, we're dealing with some of the context is slightly different but how do we then how do we then how do we then use preaching to do that sure so um vance havner i used to read him a lot when i was a young young uh, preacher he said um that um too many Christians are so subnormal that if you challenge them to be normal, they appear to be abnormal. Mm. Um, and I, I think that is the reality of the time that we live in. And I really think preaching should call us to live the normal, lift, the normal Christian life. If we just preach biblically mm. and, and uh, faithfully and clearly, I think it calls our people to a radical life of following Jesus that will demonstrate to the world the difference that that Jesus makes. Um, 
I do think preaching is very, in that regard, critical to how we go forward. I do also think, you know, we, we talk about speaking truth to power. Yes, sir. And then we, we, we pitch that to Jesus. Jesus spoke truth to power. But, and that's absolutely true. But what we don't acknowledge is when Jesus was speaking truth to power, nine out of 10 times, he wasn't going after the political authorities. He was going after the religious establishment. Mm. <laughs> there was a religious establishment that had its own agenda and had separated from the righteousness that God had called them to. And he's challenging the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, who have basically adopted worldly agendas and dressed it up in religious covering. And uh, I really do think that, as Peter says, that it, judgment needs to begin at the house of God. We need to call the church to righteousness. Yeah. Um, great, one of the sad things, even about racial, um, our church is duly aligned with the National Baptist Convention and the Southern Baptist Convention. And one of the terrible things about the church trying to call for racial reconciliation is that the church itself has been complicit historically. Um, and and if, if, it's, if we're going to make a difference in the world, the church has got to be the church. And I think preaching needs to call us to that. Yeah. So, so finishing that thought, and then we'll get into some of the questions in, in the chat. Yeah. I think you're, you're, you're leaning into, into this last piece. What are your, what are your hopes and dreams um, for preaching? Cause I feel like you, you just hinted at that. So let's, let's go there. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm discouraged by some of what I see and it's pulpit performance. And the, the pulpit, as Luther said, is the throne of the word of God. So I'm, I'm discouraged by some of what I see. I'm also discouraged, not just by pulpit performance. Um, I'm also a little bit discouraged because there's a, there's a lack of, there's a growing lack of confidence in the word of God by those who claim to be his spokesmen. Um, so I, that burden is me. But outside of that, there's a lot to be encouraged by. And there's a young generation. I'm old enough to talk about the younger generation. <laughs> there's a young generation yes, sir. of preachers. I, I'm seeing that God is raising up who are taking their calling seriously, who are taking their studies seriously, and who are taking the, the work of the church seriously. And um, I'm, I'm encouraged by that. And I would just say, Stay the course. I mean, again, the quotes, Second Timothy 4 and 2, it ends by, you know, it, it says, be faithful in season and out of season. Yes, sir. And, uh, yeah. yeah, and that, that's, that's what I, will be my hope. Great, great. So we've got a couple questions here. I'm not going to take them, for those of you that are, that are, that are submitting questions, I'm not going to take them necessarily in order. I'm going to kind of uh, jump around a little bit. Let me say um, first that someone was asking about um, the role of preaching, I'm trying to paraphrase this. They're saying that looking at preaching as historically a kind of a one directional um, in, engagement and looking at some of the new uh, manifestations and, uh, of church and community, of more dialogical communication, they're asking, do you see, do you see preaching as needing to adapt and, and, or do you see preaching as, as still a, a predominantly one-way communication as the method from here on out. Right? If I'm so, let me ask the question right. <laughs> let me let me answer that culturally and theologically. Yes, sir. Culturally, I, I culturally I grew up in black churches, so it's always dialogue. <laughs> always dialogue. Always. <laughs> and if it's not you, something's wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There is always there's been a conversation between pulpit and pew, theologically. Um, and to be fair to the question, they tag it at the end saying that there may be some con contextual cultural differences too. Go ahead. 
Sure. Yeah. So I, I would I would say though. Preaching faithfully the Bible reflects the theological truth that God speaks and we're to listen. Mm -hmm. And I think preaching, faithful preaching, honors that sense of revelation of God to us. And I don't think that the changing molds and cultural mores and all of those things, I don't think they suspend Romans 10. How can you call upon him you don't believe in? How can you believe in if you haven't heard of him? How can you hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they be sent by God? I, I believe it is still the work of God to save the lost and sanctify the church by God called preachers faithfully proclaiming the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Um, you know, we've, we've used um, technological features, you know, in the midst of the pandemic. And I just this week was having uh, conversations with some of our media team. And um, there are a lot of things that we see and we steal ideas from other people, churches. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I say, uh, you know, people, I'm, I'm just, I go in disguise as a guest speaker, but I'm actually doing industrial espionage for Shiloh <laughs> church for me to steal ideas and bring back home. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I'm also as a pastor needing to shepherd our media ministry. I know we live in an anti-authoritarian age. We live mm -hmm. in an age where people uh, object or uh, reject uh, the notion of objective truth. I believe the communication forms are rapidly changing. But while we talk about all of that, listen, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I believe when the preacher is preaching the word of God, I believe that we have an element that the president with his bully pulpit doesn't have, that CNN, Fox News, with worldwide reach 24 hours a day do not have. When we stand with an open Bible and proclaim the living word of God, the author of the scriptures is at work yeah. to renew minds, to change hearts, and to produce faith. And I think, um, I've been thinking about that a lot. You know, it said, my, my, my historical hero is, is Charles Spurgeon. And it said that in his weakened condition, he would walk up to his pulpit and each step going up, he would say to himself, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. And that ought to be the burden of every preacher. That our confidence is not in the communication, um, our, our, our eloquence or our wisdom. We stand on the word of God with confidence that the Holy Spirit is at work. And I think the agency of a Holy Spirit working through a God-called preacher uh, is, is not to be canceled, if I can, for, for, for new models of preaching. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I, I often, when, when I get the privilege to, to, to teach a preaching class, when I get the privilege, mm -hmm. I know Dr. Clark is here somewhere. Um, I think one of the things that I try to stress, because I see a couple of questions people are asking about, how do we know when this type of preaching, this type of faithful preaching, um, more expositional preaching, I, I think that's what they're getting at, is taking place. And I think one of the things that I try to stress is that preaching is calling and craft. And depending on the tradition that you come out of, some traditions have stressed the craft of preaching more than the calling of preaching, and some have stressed the calling of preaching more than the craft of preaching. And I think that if we have been called to preach, if we have that burden and a passion to preach, and we have to mirror that with, with study habits, with, with time, with prayer, with other things that come alongside us to allow us to be able to do that process of rightly dividing uh, the word of God. So if there's anything else that you want to say, I, I would like to say um, that was so my, that was my alley. -oop. There's a there's I, I'm I think the language of expositional preaching is important. There is an outfit that pro, is promoting um, text driven preaching. 
And I, I think the expositional preaching is sufficient language, but I am fascinated by that terminology because I, the inevitable fact is, Dwight, something drives every sermon. I don't care what setting, what denomination, what culture. When a person stands to preach, something is in the driver's seat driving that sermon. Do you agree with that? Yes. And so, I mean, my father was a faithful preacher. He was not an expositor. My homiletical hero, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, is the prince of preachers. He was not an expositor. But he, they preached text-driven preaching. The word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, was, was the driving of the sermon. There are sermons that you hear and you, and you could feel, you could, you could hear and just hear that the eloquence of the speaker is what's driving this message. There, there, are, there are sermons you hear where illustration is obvious. There's some dominating illustration. And they don't have no points in the text, but they got three points about the story that they told. <laughs> um, there, there are some, they're the, they're, the, they're, the, they're the money guys and gals. And it don't matter what text, you know, send me a seed offering. It's going to be the end of this sermon. Something is driving every sermon. And you don't even have to know the different types of sermon. I think in the pew, a person can get a sense of what's driving the, the, the message. And I really do believe faithful preaching, if I can use that language, is driven by the text of scripture. It is doing everything it can to let God have his say, to be, if you, if you will, a mouthpiece for the text. Yeah, yeah, amen. Amen. There is one question from my my my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Jeanette Oak, and um, there's a couple more of my, my my students and sisters in here. So I wanna I wanna make a I'm gonna make a last comment at that. And she's asking about ways that um, even during the civil rights movement today, that the pulpit has been um, a place that has often muted voices of women. Um, and so I wanna I wanna take that one and deal with that one before we before we close. But I wanna make sure that I give you a space. Uh, Dr. Charles, Pastor Charles, HB. Uh, yeah. I want to make sure I just give you a space to make any last uh, comments, last, last share, uh, share last thoughts that you want to share, and then I'll deal with the. I want to respond to the last question on behalf of my sisters. That's great. Sure. Um, yeah. No, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to share. Um, and I would just repeat. Um, I know there's a, you said there's a tension between calling and crafting, but somewhere in between there is, is the basis of, of our preaching. Um, the power of preach it's, it's interesting that in second Timothy four and two, Paul does not just tell P, P, Timothy that he must preach, but what he must preach. Mm. You would think that would be assumed. Yeah. But he makes it explicit that you must preach the word. And it's just a reminder that it is not, it is not the function of preaching that carries the power. It's the content of the preaching. Mm. It, it's it's not it's not my preaching that makes the gospel work. It's it's the gospel that makes my lousy preaching work. And so I, you know, we want to we want to we want to let the word of God speak. Um, and uh, that's the bridge I think between calling and craft mm. is that it is it is rooted on the foundation of God's word. Amen. 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 Let me say this um, uh, to to my to my to my colleagues and to um, my my sisters that are watching. Um, I just want to state unequivocally that we know for a fact that um, historically that the pulpit has been a place um, that has uh, negatively impacted our sisters uh, more than more than others. And I think that if we talk about um, when we talk about things like the civil rights movement. When we talk about historical movements, we tend to relegate the roles of women to they sang on this program or they did this. Um, and we don't often highlight the voices, the sacrifices, the messages, the meaning, the work of, of our sisters. And I think that this is specifically why I was very intentional about our invitation for tomorrow. That as we talk about 
as we move into tomorrow about preaching and pastoring, um, we must be able to hear, not just to hear voices of women, but to hear their voices, their experiences, their, their lenses, uh, the realities, because that's all part of the kingdom of God. And so I wanted to make sure that I spoke to that um, specifically, that it is, we recognize the historic harm that has been done. Um, record after record has been uh, spoken of about uh, men who, um, men who, who were great men in, in movements and not very good men um, as men um, in the way that they treated uh, their sisters, their wives, uh, et cetera. And so as we move into and position ourselves to, to engage tomorrow, as opposed to me sitting here and just giving a, a fuller statement on our affirmation of women in ministry, I think it's important as, well, as I often do in my, in my own courses, as opposed to speaking for women, uh, I'm going to let them speak for themselves. And so tomorrow, uh, join me. Uh, you will get to hear from uh, Pastor Sonia Dawson. You'll get to hear from Pastor uh, Najuma Smith Pollard, um, as well as Pastor Shep Crawford uh, and, Pastor, uh, and Mike Z Pastor Mike Fisher at Zion. And you're going to hear from these, from their own voices, from their own experiences. But we wanted to make sure that I had a chance to say that and to name that. So with that said, I want to once again thank um, Pastor H.B. Charles. Uh, sir, I, you're not as sad as I am that you could not come. Uh, trust me, you're not as sad as I am. Um, but I, I give you my word that at the moment we get a chance to get past this, we would love to have you come out and, and share, with, share with our students in person. Um, I know that Dr. Clark uh, our homiletics, uh, homiletics professor on the line right now. I know that he would love that opportunity as well. So thank you so much for your time in the midst of this pandemic, your family, your ministry, everything else is going on. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks for having me. I hope that we'll get a chance to do it in person at some point. And thank you for the privilege to share this time, though. All the best.